It's great. Thank you so, so much, Evan, for that welcome. Um, as Evan said, my name's Ross. Um, I'm one of the pastors poured down Elam. I'm married to Natasha. And we have three kids. Um, Joel, our oldest, is in the youth meeting. And then our daughter, Libby, is in the kids meeting. And then our youngest, our foster son, is he's in the creche as well. So we should really be going out for a date somewhere um, while they're all out different places. And I do have this anxiety that our youngest one, his number's going to come up on this screen could the parents of number uh, as I'm speaking um, but it's really amazing just to get the chance to share I'm always amazed when it comes to preaching that I get to preach that I get to do this I'm always always fascinated that the Lord has allowed me to do this and also always fascinated the fact that people know that I do it and they still come back or that they still come um, but I'm really really pleased to have this opportunity to share with you tonight in a few moments we're going to read from Isaiah 6 but um, a number of years ago probably about 15 years ago I was witness to uh, a road traffic accident that wasn't far from here, this building actually, the bottom of the shore road, there was a bus, a city bus came into the side of a, a woman, an elderly lady who was in the inside lane. He came from the outside lane and just went right into the side of her. Um, I didn't have much time to really stay with the lady. She phoned the police. So what I did was I gave her my card and I said, listen, if you need us or for anything, please just let me know. Um, didn't hear anything more. A couple of months later, then I was called to court to be a witness of this accident that I had to go. So I attended court that day um, and they had told me that I didn't officially have to come to court, but it would really help the lady's case if I did. So I turned up that day, went to the court proceedings and I was called to the stand. Then when I was called to the stand, the opposing barrister, he just then tried to, I don't know, it, he just tore me apart in a few minutes. He, he questioned my story. He questioned my intelligence. He questioned my knowledge of the highway code. He questioned my eyesight. He said, I see you wear glasses, so therefore your eyesight isn't that great. And I wanted, I just didn't want to agree with him. I wanted to say to him, not that great. You wouldn't believe how bad it is. It's absolutely terrible, really. Um, but, but I didn't think that would help the lady's case. And after he'd insulted me all of these times, in the end, I just said, listen, he was in a bus and he drove into her. I don't know what other way I can put it. Anyway, the lady won um, and for all of her trouble, she got the huge compensation of 100 pounds. Um, I know, and, and, but she won. And anyway, when all this court proceedings was coming to an end, the judge, the judge took a moment and said, I want to thank Mr. McBride for coming here today. Um, we don't have very many witnesses who turn up to this kind of thing. Um, and then he looked at me and he said, Thank you for appearing here today. I thought it was really, really interesting language, like really, really interesting language to use. Thank you for coming here, and thank you for appearing here today. And I was amazed by what had happened in that courtroom, that there was a verdict that was made, that there were people who came and brought their cases, and there was a verdict that was made, and something took place in one room that had consequences outside that room. And by the fact that he said, thank you for appearing here today, it made me think a little bit about what scripture shows us. Psalm 82, 2 Chronicles 18, Job 1, Zechariah 3, Hebrews 4, all of them show us that somewhere in the heavens, there is this heavenly council place. Somewhere up there above us in the heavens, there is this heavenly council place where the Lord sits upon his throne. That there is something that is far, far bigger than what we would ever realize that is happening up there. That there is a place where verdicts are made there is a place where things, are, where things are said, where things are spoken in one place and one realm that change things on earth down here. And I was beginning to think, just like that judge kind of said to me, thank you for appearing here today. I was wondering what would it look like if our prayer lives were a little bit less of just reading or, 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 or reciting like a routine um, list of needs, you know? And what if our prayer lives kind of look something like we are appearing before the throne of God? What if our our prayer lives looked a little bit more like actually we're coming before him and standing before him believing that something that will be said in that place will change the atmosphere or something around us. What if our prayer lives, what if our worship looked different than just coming and singing songs but our worship was bringing us before the very throne of God where we believe things are going to be sanctioned and verdicts are going to be given and things are going to be changed. What if our prayer and our worship looked more like that? What would we see happen? What would we see take place? What if we realize that there's one who sits on the throne? He is longing for us to come boldly before his throne into his heavenly court and council 
And just like that judge said, thanks for coming, not many come. The truth is that we don't have to go. We can just keep praying our prayers and we can just keep singing our songs or we could be the church that comes in and draws close. We could be the church that comes before his throne and cries out to him and believes that whatever he says in that place cannot and will not be opposed. Isaiah chapter six, uh, verse one, you'll know this passage really, really well. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One cried out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom will I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. It's a really, really well-known passage. It's going to be used throughout the week. I know Alistair's going to use part of it tomorrow night as well. And I want to use kind of this passage or this vision that Isaiah had to maybe uh, give us a bit of a framework for what I hope will be for all of us an opportunity to, tonight to have a real encounter with the living God. An opportunity tonight, I mean, to really experience his presence. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a prophet by any stretch, but every now and again, the Lord's very, very gracious and, and gives me a bit of an idea sometimes of what might happen or could happen. And um, as I've been thinking about tonight and praying about tonight, I really did sense the Lord say, so I don't want to throw this at you at the end of the meeting. I want to show you this is where we're going. Um, I really did sense that the Lord would fill people with the Holy Spirit tonight. And the phrase that I sensed the Lord say, that there would be many people in this place would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So I just want to say to you, if you're here tonight, wherever you are, you have never experienced the power of God coming upon your life. You have never experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You've never experienced what it is for God to come close like that. I want to say to you, tonight is your night that the Lord wants to meet with people here. I also had this picture just as I was praying. It seemed a little bit strange, but as I was praying, I seen this box, this present that was being opened. And when the wrapping paper came off, it was, it was like a shoe box. And, and in the shoe box was a pair of boots, but it was like football boots. And I was really just, what did that mean? Or what does the Lord want to do? And I really did sense that the Lord was saying to leaders in here, that he's going to give you some new shoes for a new season. He's going to bring you into a new place, that you're going to go into the next season really, really running. And that's just a couple of things that I really, really do feel. I, I know the Lord's going to do that. Totally convinced that the Lord's going to do that. Now, way over here. I think there's a whole lot of other things that the Lord could do tonight, but that will all be hunger dependent. That will all just be dependent on like how much we'll press in, how much we long for him, how much we, like, we really want him, how hungry we are for him. That will all be dependent on how much we will cry out for him to come. So we'll use this vision just in a couple of points that all overlap, an upward vision, an inward vision, and an outward vision. And an upward vision, this vision is breathtaking because Isaiah actually interacts with a heavenly council that's going on with what's happening in this heavenly realm. Isaiah interacts with the angels that are worshiping and what is happening there. And as we see that Isaiah in some way is lifted up to what is a heavenly temple, heavenly council place. And we see in scripture that Moses is given such detail about the tabernacle because it seems as though some way the tabernacle, the temple, it kind of mirrors something that is happening in, in that heavenly temple. And in that place, Isaiah sees the Lord, but he can't describe him. All he can do is kind of talk about the grandeur of his clothing. All he can do is kind of say something about the power of the worship that is going on in that place. And he can talk about that, but he can't actually describe what he looks like. It's a bit like John in the book of Revelation. All he can do is say, There's, it's something, it's like this, but I can't really put it into words. Isaiah says that the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. And in some ways, this is, it's not a dream, and it's not just like a mere vision. This is like a heaven, heavenly reality being made known to a person, to a man. And I have to say that I don't think it's the most holy man or the man who had prayed the most, but this gets known to a man. He gets lifted up from where he is into a place of encounter. And an encounter that is breathtaking, exhilarating, that's painful and life-changing. 
a moment in time before the throne of God. And I hope we long for encounters. I hope you're here tonight. You long. I kind of feel this past season has robbed us from encounters. It's robbed us from moments of just being before him and experiencing his presence together. There's a whole lot of us, like, we get into pastor and stuff that, that, we, that we love people, so that's why we get into it. And, and we love preaching the word of God, but some of us, we got into this because we just love the presence of God. And we love bringing people into the presence of God. And it's the presence of God that we're really after. And we come to this, Isaiah has this encounter I would love us to experience something of tonight. Really quickly, a little bit about the text. It's good to give some background around the text. Verse 1 says, in the year that King Uzziah died. If you didn't have any clue who Uzziah was, um, he was a king who had reigned for like 52 years. Since the age of 16, he'd reigned. He'd reigned pretty well over most of his life and most of his career as the king. He was all that the nation knew. He led the nation through real times of prosperity and real times of ease. He built a big, powerful nation, a big, powerful kingdom. But understand this, you can read all about it in um, like Second Chronicles uh, chapter 26 in and around there that you can read about what happens towards the end of his life because something remarkable happens and not in a good way at the end of his life. At the end of his life, this man who had reigned for 52 years so, so well, at the end of his life, instead of becoming older and wiser, he becomes more arrogant. Instead of becoming older and more mature, he doesn't, he becomes more full of pride. And you can read about what happened to him, but he, he went in one day to the temple, to the earthly temple. He went into the temple and he burnt incense. Now he was the king. He wasn't a Levite and he wasn't a priest. He wasn't meant to be in that certain area of the temple. And he wasn't meant to be burning incense in that certain area of the temple. He was the king, but he didn't have any legal or spiritual right to be in that position. He was in the wrong place, performing the wrong action and the Lord was not pleased with him. And after that, after he had done that, leprosy broke out over him. He had leprosy and his life ended because of that sometime after. That this man who was the king, who everybody wanted to be around and everybody wanted time with him, everyone wanted to spend time with him, he ends up his life alone and in seclusion. This man had grown in some way in, in pride. He had grown in some way in, in arrogance. And maybe you, how do you, how do you lead so well for 50 years? And then, towards the end of your ministry, when you should be far more wiser and far more mature. You understand tonight that sometimes people in church, not anybody here, sometimes people in church can say, so those young people need to be more mature. Actually, as this story tells us, that maybe sometimes it's the people who've known him a while. They're the ones who take him for granted. And you might say, well, um, Uzziah's sin wouldn't be my sin. It's not like I'm going to go into some temple and burn incense somewhere. What's that even look like today? You might say, it's not going to be my... Well, is it the action? Is it the action or is it the attitude of his heart? Because the attitude of his heart is he presumes that he should be there. I'm the leader. I can do it. I can do whatever I want. He presumes. And that's the sin. The sin is presumption. The sin is for any child of God who any of us start to think, I know what God wants to do. Or I can just take God for granted. And I can just go in and do whatever I want. And God will just have to be. I presume on God or assume. And our hearts become full of pride and arrogance. David shared it so, so well this morning. And you might think he's treated harshly. He didn't really do anything wrong. Well, again, the big, big story around it is there are 81 priests at that time who all tell him, don't do this, and he doesn't listen to any of them. He's not listening to anybody. He's presuming on God. He thinks he knows what God wants. He thinks he knows what will be okay with God. He's approaching God. He's, he's, he's flippant. He's complacent. And he's doing this in his older years. Not as a young person. He's doing this when he should know better. He's taking God for granted as he gets older. Uzziah wasn't a priest and he shouldn't have been there. He ends up in his life secluded and alone. You and I have to be careful. You and I have to be careful of our inner lives, of what's going on on the inside of us. Again, this is not some outward sin. This is not some, he didn't, you know, he, he, it wasn't adultery or idolatry or it wasn't fraud or it wasn't any of those things. It was just taking God for granted. It was just allowing his heart to kind of drift some way from the Lord. 
So Uzziah dies and Isaiah is sad. Isaiah is his friend, possibly even his relative. Uh, Some um, commentators would say that Isaiah is his friend and he is sad and the nation's sad in their mourning. And it's in this space that Isaiah gets the vision. Now here's the thing. This is a wee bit of the text that I love that I want you to see. Uzziah is punished, it seems. for go- He's not a Levite or a priest. And he goes into uh, the temple and he burns incense. He had no legal or spiritual right to be there. Now here's Isaiah. Isaiah is not a priest. Isaiah is not a Levite either. And Isaiah is taken from where he is into the heavenly temple. And really, if it was on earth, Isaiah would have no right to be there. He would have no legal or spiritual standing to be in that place. But yet in the heavenly temple, in this vision, he can be there. Why? Because he doesn't have the pride and he doesn't have the arrogance that he's a man of deep humility. He's a man who knows his sin and understands his sin. As we approach the Lord tonight, you and I need to understand that legally and spiritually, we would have no right to be before him if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus. We would have no right to be before him if the Lord hadn't have came, taken away our sin, if it wasn't for Calvary. It's a reminder for all of us And especially for those of us, if you're here tonight and you're a new believer, I'm so delighted that you're here. So delighted that you're here. If you're here and you've been on the road a while, you be careful. Be careful that you and I don't start taking them for granted. We don't start assuming that we know what he wants and what's okay. We don't allow our hearts to drift. We don't allow pride or arrogance to rise in our hearts in any way. We watch how we approach him. The second thing is this inward vision. Isaiah says, woe is me. He says, woe is me, I am a man. Even that phrase shows that he has no pride. He says, woe is me, for I am undone. I am, other translations, I am, I am unzipped. I am falling apart. I am ruined. He feels dirty in this place of beauty and glory. You understand in this, in this uh, vision that he has, that when Isaiah is in this place of beauty and glory, he's not saying to everybody, look at me, look at me. He's, a- he's actually saying, please don't look at me. Nobody look at me. He doesn't want any attention upon himself at all in this dramatic encounter. And here's the bit that I find absolutely fascinating. Isaiah is taken into this heavenly council place, lifted up, seeing the Lord. Where is the first place Isaiah goes to? The first place Isaiah goes to as he sees the Lord is, my mouth is dirty. Does that seem interesting, strange? Would that be your first place if you had an encounter with the Lord being before his throne? Your first would be, I wonder what's passed through my lips. I wonder what's came out of my mouth. And his first kind of place where he checks is, 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 what have I spoken and what have I said? He said that I am a man, I have unclean lips. The original is more like, my mouth is like a sewer. I suppose Isaiah, if he, and he's a man of great humility, if he had any pride, it would be in the fact that he can speak. He's a prophet. And even that, he feels in some way, is unclean. Now, here's the bit that I, I'm, I was trying to work out. As Isaiah says, my mouth is unclean, that I, my mouth is like a sewer. What could Isaiah possibly have said that would make him feel like that? Let's be realistic here. He's the prophet. Like, it's not like he's running about swearing and shouting obscenities at people. It's not that he's using and telling crude jokes somewhere. It's not that he's using foul language somewhere. Why does he go to his mouth? Why does he talk about his speech, first of all, when he comes before the Lord? And it seems that from what we have of what he said, what has passed through his lips is the five chapters before. And what is it? He hasn't said anything wrong. And he, he, he hasn't said anything that seems to be sinful. He hasn't said he's, he's prophesied what he's felt the Lord has given him. I'm sure it's, it's, it's the way he's interpreted it. But what has he spoken in those five chapters? Well, he has said in those chapters, he's spoken, he's, he's spoken despair. And he's spoken hopelessness in a way. He has spoken unbelief. He's even spoken of a really negative outlook. He's made the nation feel a bit like it's a bit hopeless, a bit like it's all gone. And maybe that's what's being exposed in him when he stands before the Lord that he realizes that that's what his mouth has spoken. That's what's passed through his lips. It's this negative outlook. It's a bit like some of those Christians that you know, you know, 
know, some of those people that you know who always just complain, who always just have a negative outlook about everything, who come to your church and when they talk to you about it, they make you feel as though you're on the Titanic and it's all sinking and it's all disappearing somewhere. It's those people who always have this negative outlook about everything and you're just waiting for someone to, ch- to say, I know, but God could, and they never do. It's that person who despair has set in and it's in their voice and in their speech. Hopelessness has set in. Unbelief has set in. Defeat has set in. Woundedness has set in and it's coming out of their mouth all the time. It's that person. There's a story, if you're part of the running community, you may have heard this story before about a brave young girl named Gabriel Grinwald. Gabriel was a young, newly married girl, and she was a Team USA middle distance runner. She was tipped to compete at the highest level. Unfortunately, she was diagnosed with cancer. She got treatment, chemo, and she went into remission. She kept running, and she kept competing. Sometime after, she saw her oncologist, and she was told the cancer had returned. And this time, it would require major surgery, removing half of her liver along with the tumor. Gabriel had the surgery and treatment, and three months later, she appeared at the starting line of a track event with a large scar coming right down her abdomen. At her next PET scan, she had hoped that the report would show no signs of tumor or cancer, but it did show up cancer. Her oncologist called her and her husband, Justin, in, and this time informed them that her cancer had returned and it would take her life. Her response to the oncologist that day was, but not today. She kept running, she kept competing. In between chemo treatments, she attended a national qualifying event and came in 10th place. And due to the wear and tear on her body, that was like winning gold at the Olympics. She kept running until she couldn't run anymore. She was often quoted saying, it's okay to struggle, it is not okay to give up. When she couldn't run anymore, she set up a charity that raises money to do research in the rare forms of cancer. She passed away in 2019, aged 32. And now people in the running community all over the world, we know her story, and some even run with their charity name on their tops. The name of her charity, Brave Like Gabe. And the tagline for her charity is Running On Hope running on hope. Church, if ever there was a time for you and I to rise up and run on hope, it would be today. If ever there was a time for the church to rise up and and run with hope and to run into the face of darkness with the hope of Jesus Christ, it would be today. It would be now. I know there's a judgment to come. I know that the Lord will come and he will wrap everything up, but it's not today, it seems. This is the day of grace. This is the day of salvation. This is the day of redemption. And if only the church could maybe rise up, if it could kind of rise up above the despair and above the hopelessness and all that rhetoric that's all going on and all that talk and all that noise that's going on everywhere else, if we could rise up with this message of hope and run on hope and run with hope and declare that Jesus Christ is our Redeemer, our Savior, we might see some kind of transformation. Church, I know, I know you're going to say, listen, listen, culture's changing really, really fast and everything's changing all around us. It's not the way it used to be. Listen, church, if you understand your Bible, you know your Bible, you know that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. It abounds all the more. That the grace of God abounds all the more. That we need to understand. I've heard, I hope I don't offend. Well, maybe I don't mind if I offend some people, but I have heard over these past two years with the pandemic, I've heard a lot of Christians and they have been repeating some kind of second coming rhetoric and some kind of said, listen, he's coming. Listen, the pandemic didn't make me aware that he was coming. The pandemic didn't say to me, it's the signs of the times. I already knew that he's coming very, very soon. I knew that he's always been coming. He is coming. He's coming to receive his church. But here's what I also knew. I also knew that preceding his coming, scripture says, the church will rise up, that he is coming for a pure, spotless bride, that the church will be at its most intercessory, that the church will be at its most hungry, that he is returning for a church that rises is above all of that and runs into the face of the darkness of the uncertainty and declares that Jesus Christ is the hope. I know the times are changing all around us, but he is coming for a pure spotless bride. His glory will be seen in the church, not when he appears, but before he appears. And if anybody believed that, they'd shout amen right now and they praise him that that's who we are. 
who we're called to be. People who run with hope. People who carry hope. The manifest grace of God will be seen. The Spirit, uh, Re- Revelation 22, 17, the Spirit and the bride say, come Lord Jesus. You know that verse? So we have the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the church, the bride, and the Holy Spirit within the church in the days before his coming gives out this cry that he would come. What's it mean? Well, of course, it's he would come in his return. But I also believe It means that the spirit in the church begins this cry of, Lord, come in your return, but Lord, come to us in revival. Come to us in revival. Come to us in visitation. Come to us in the way that you promised. There's this cry that comes from the spirit and the bride together. Verses that I've been meditating on for a couple of months, you know, uh, Deuteronomy 31. And and it it says that, uh, here, let me read it. Uh, The Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. It's a simple truth that he went before us and goes before us amidst personal, national, global crisis in the face of uncertainty. Listen, the world needs a church to rise up and say, Jesus is in tomorrow. Jesus is already there. And that doesn't have this hopelessness. And maybe like Isaiah, maybe before the Lord, we need our mouths to be cleansed. Because maybe we've been making statements of unbelief, statements of despair and hopelessness. Maybe we need our mouths to be touched. What has passed through our lips this week? Isaiah doesn't say it's somebody else's fault, it's somebody else's sin. He says, no, it's my sin, my tongue, my speech. Our words have a fragrance even long before or even long after we move off that scene. Our words stay. The power of life and death are in the tongue. Prophet Zephaniah says that again, preceding the Lord's return, that he will, he will purify the lips of the, the, the sons of Levi, the priests, that we will have our mouths cleansed. I don't think Isaiah was using swear words or obscenities. I just think he had a lack of hope in his voice. It was all despair. But then that would change very, very quickly as the Lord touches his mouth. I believe that this is what we're called to as believers, a higher standard of speech. I believe this is what Jesus is talking about, Mark 16, they will speak with new tongues. Yeah, yeah it's the, the speaking in tongues, but they'll, they'll have a different language. They'll, they'll speak differently than they used to, that their speech will be different. Commissioned believers, our language will change in some way. And, and one of the angels who's crying, holy, 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 One of the angels who is worshiping, and the power of the worship shakes the temple, but one of the angels who's worshiping stops their worship, goes to the altar, takes a coal from the altar. Now, watch the text. The angel can't lift the coal with its hand. The angel has to use tongs to lift the coal that's on the altar. So the angel stops its worship, comes to the altar, lifts the coal with tongs because the angel can't pick it up, then comes and touches the mouth of Isaiah. And we, we, we don't, well, from the text it says that he doesn't scream or he doesn't, that, that the coal touches his mouth and, and the Lord speaks to him, he's purified, you know, and, and there's a much, much bigger story I haven't got enough time to give you in and around all of that and what it symbolizes and what it means. But this coal that has been lit on the altar of God in heaven touches the mouth of the prophet. The coal burns away his sin. I wonder like if, if Jesus was to really touch our mouths tonight, really touch our speech and our language, that our mouths were touched and sanctified by a burning coal. Isaiah's words would now have fire. He will be touched. His, his speech will have fire. It will have energy. It will have urgency. He would have holy fire in his mouth. You know, Pentecost began with tongues of fire resting upon Everyone, it seemed, in the upper room. Now, I believe this is contrary to maybe to some, maybe what your pastor has taught, but I, I, I believe I speak in tongues, pray in tongues, worship in tongues, love praying in tongues. I don't believe it's the only sign of being filled with the Spirit. I believe the evidence of being filled with the Spirit is that your speech gets empowered and inspired and touched. Your speech gets touched. You speak with new tongues in all kinds of different ways. That's the promise, and that's what comes upon people. The fire of God touching our mouths. 
Our God is a consuming fire and he must be served by those who are on fire, those who've been touched with fire. And you and I need to guard the fire that's been placed in our hearts and in our mouths. Sometimes we need to let our words be far, far fewer, refrain from some of the talk, because the message is just so pure. The redemption message is so pure. Samuel Chadwick say, people ablaze are invincible. Hell trembles when men and women kindle fire. The church is powerless without the flame of the Holy Ghost. Destitute of fire, nothing else really matters. Without flame and fervor of the Holy Ghost, the church will never accomplish its mission. Uzziah, his life is taken eventually for going into the temple and burning fire. Isaiah is brought into the presence of the Lord and touched with fire. Jesus came to light a fire on the inside of us. You know that scripture in, in Luke chapter 12 where Jesus is talking to his, his, and he says, I have come to light a fire on this earth and how I wish it were already kindled. How I wish it were already burning. I've came to bring fire. I've been, I've been doing this for a while now. And, and you know, don't let my receding hairline fool you. I am young. I am. I am young. I am. There are weeks I am just convinced my birth certificate is wrong. There is no way. I, I, I am. There's no way I'm in my 40s. I'm convinced I am 33. Absolutely convinced in my head. That's where I am. But I have been doing this for a long time, for about 20 years now. And for about 20 years now, do you know what it feels like? For about 20 years, it feels like all I've done is put out fires. It seems as though I've just went from one situation to another situation do another thing and I've put out a fire and put out here it's about time we started to light some fires isn't it it's about time we started to light but some of that stuff that see Pip, I'm not like Pip he's the man who never ages at the, you know um, but what we have is he got up and he talked about that that's what we need to do across this island we need to light some fires we need in this season for Elam to go and to light some fires with the power of the Holy Spirit because the majority of us who have been around a while when we came into the things of the Spirit didn't we come into an awareness that it's a baptism of the Holy Spirit and a baptism of fire? Didn't we know that? It was the baptism of fire over our lives. We came into it with an awareness that the fire of God would touch us and we would be changed and we would be transformed, that the fire of God would come. And here's what I need us to know. As Pip put that picture up on the screen and the, the picture of George Jeffries and the men and women back there. Listen, the reason, the reason I'm saying all of that about 20 years ago of getting into this, I grew up in an Elam church. I suppose it was inevitable I've become an Elam pastor, you know, and, and the, the process of getting in now has changed to when it was. I probably wouldn't get in now. But anyway, and, and what, what happened was that I wanted to become an Elam pastor. Why? There's a whole bunch of reasons. Here's one of them. I knew that Elam had been touched with holy fire from heaven. I knew that over a hundred years ago, there was men and women who, whatever way it worked, there was a coal from the altar of heaven that touched their mouths and they preached and they called out healings and they went into towns and cities and people were drawn and churches were planted and churches were started. Here, Elam, how have we stewarded the fire? How have we stewarded the fire that God has given us? Because the truth is, maybe it's me, I don't see it much today. I don't hear it much in prayer. I don't see it much in worship. I don't, I don't see and sense much of fire, passion and desire. I hear great sermons, which is awesome. But I don't hear much of people want to encounter the presence of Jesus, wanting to be changed and transformed by him and going and seeing other places changed and transformed. Where is the fire? We need a fresh touch. And the last point is an outward vision. What takes place in this kind of heavenly council? Well, this is the sending part, the bit um, maybe David was saying that he wasn't touching on this morning. We see that there is a conversation that happens in heaven. The conversation, it seems, is between the Trinity or at least the angelic host. I believe it's not the Trinity asking for conscripts, but there's just a conversation that Isaiah overhears. And the conversation amongst the Trinity is what the Lord, this is where we understand what the Lord views as important, what the Lord sees as what is most important. 
that it's this conversation that is taking place. It's his message spreading. It's people hearing his message. This is what's important. Isaiah's taken up to heaven and he hears a heavenly conversation and the heavenly conversation about who will go and who will go and reach those people. That's what heaven's talking about. That's what's on the mind of the judge or the king who's on the throne. That's what's on his mind. And that's what is important to him in this heavenly council. You have to understand, and I'm sure you're aware of it, that up in that heavenly council place, the heavenly council of God isn't, isn't kind of watching on to see if the communion table's in the center or it's on the left, or the heavenly council of God is not wondering, I wonder if they'll do five songs or I wonder if they'll do four songs. Nobody's looking down from heaven saying, I wonder if they'll actually get to sit in the same seat that they get to sit in. That is not what concerns the Lord at all. That's not what he's thinking about. That's just the book that's waiting, I'm waiting to write one day. Stuff the Lord does not care about. I remember hearing one time, it was someone and he was, he, he was old older than me and I didn't have any kids at the time but I remember that this pastor who said we have to be really really careful because if the children run about in the church and some of them come up and approach the stage it might quench the spirit give me a break what is that about what is that about you don't want to come to our church the kids run everywhere stuff we think is important here's what's really important here's what's on the mind of the trinity in that conversation who will go? Who will go? What is important to the Trinity? If we think it's just about these, you know, what songs are being sung, or J.B. Phillips and his book say, your God is too small. Here's what's important to heaven. It's a story I shared a couple of weeks ago at Flo. It's the story of Pete and Jenna. Everything changed in one church service in one day. They had two boys and they both had very promising, well-paying careers. They had a big house with a swimming pool and nice cars to drive. Then in one service in one night, God called them to spend their lives loving the forgotten people. They started ministering to the poor and spending time with the homeless. God began to give them a heart for the children of Southeast Asia. They adopted a girl from there called Priscilla. Soon afterwards, they sold their house and their belongings and they moved their now free children to Southeast Asia. They, had, they knew nothing and little of the language the culture. They volunteered in orphanages, ministering to babies, specifically those with cleft palates who had a problem swallowing. Many of the babies were dying and malnourished because the orphanage didn't have the equipment or the expertise to deal with these babies. Jenna cried out to God for a way to help. She ordered feeder, feeding bottles and pillows from America and she tried to teach the nurses to sit the babies up and how to burp them. One day there was a tiny baby girl crying. Jenna said she was so small she could fit in my hand. I said to the head nurse, can I please hold her? She said, yes, go ahead, and she let me pick her up. Jenna said, when I picked her up, I immediately heard the voice of the Lord like I had never heard it before. I heard him say, tell her I heard her cry, and that's why I sent you. She was to speak to this tiny baby to say, the father heard you cry and sent me. This is what's important to heaven. This is what is on the mind of the Trinity, is that he hears the cries. He hears the, cry, he hears the cries from every street, behind every door, in every place, in every village, in every town, in every city, in every county of this island. He hears the crying. And the conversation is, who will go? The conversation isn't demanding anybody isn't conscripting or strong arming anybody. It's who will go. Isaiah is sent. Isaiah, Isaiah and, and where do we need to go? As we've heard already, we need people to go right across this island. Some from this place will go right across the world, I'm sure. But we definitely, definitely in these years need people to go right across this island. Isaiah didn't geographically, Isaiah didn't really go anywhere. He went back to the same people. He went back, but he knew that he was sent and he went back and he didn't speak hopelessness anymore. He started to say some stuff like, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. He went back with some kind of hope in his voice that you and I need to have an encounter with the Lord and know that we are sent. Isaiah goes back to that same people and the Lord tells him, no one's going to listen to you. He still goes. It's going to be an uphill struggle. He still goes. You won't achieve everything that you want. He still goes and he's still willing because he feels sent. And now today we read his prophecies nearly every week and he's given us probably one of, if not the most beautiful passage of scripture in Isaiah 53 that we all just read and, and thank him for. 
Isaiah is sent because the Lord hears cries and wants people to respond. I'm going to ask the band to come. That will encourage me to try and finish. Um, the band will maybe come and just play in the background. Um, as we come to a bit of a, a conclusion and a bit of a space where um, we wait on the Lord, what I'd love to ask is, do you think Isaiah was pursuing this vision? Do you think he asked for this and wants this? Because if you read the text, it seems like he's just taken there, transported there, as if he maybe didn't ask for it and he maybe didn't want it. But the chapter started off as we started off in the year that King Uzziah died, at a time of crisis, at a critical time, at a time of change in the nation, at a changing of the guard, a changing of the monarchy. He has this vision at a crisis moment. And that suggests to me that whether he expected a vision like this or not, he was in a posture of looking to the Lord. He was in a place of pursuing the Lord and crying out for the Lord. The nation had been thrown into such uncertainty. It was at crisis point. The kingdom had been shaken. And he looks to the Lord. I think he was pursuing the vision in some way. And I wonder, is that where the church is at? I wonder, is that where we are at? Crisis point. At a point of time where there's change where the need is greater than ever before, where the resources seem to be less than ever before, where the Lord is calling us to be stronger and bolder than ever before, where something in us knows that only a move of His Spirit and an outpouring from heaven will bring transformation and change. A crucial moment in church, a crucial crisis moment in the time of a movement, a pivotal moment and a pivotal time the church hasn't, no matter how much people might say it, and some people might say it, the church hasn't been under persecution in, in our country over these last couple of years. But I suppose we have been online and, and in person, online, in person, and now we're kind of doing both of those things together. And routines and cycles have been broken. And there's this sense that we need to act now. But the Lord wants to act now. There's the sense that it is a bit of a pivotal crisis moment in the life of a church, in the life of a movement. Prophetically, I kind of see it as, do you remember the story in Acts 16 that Paul and Silas are taken into jail and they're in prison and it's, it, they've been beaten up and they're chained to the wall and it's midnight and all, all that's just so amazing about it. It's the fact that they sing at midnight, but they're chained to the wall and they begin to sing. Here's the thing. Everything in, should have allowed them to Oh, here, if anybody shouldn't have to sing right now, it's you too. <laughs> after being beaten up, after the blood still oozing from your wounds. And at midnight, Tozer said revival comes after midnight. At midnight, at midnight, they begin to sing and they begin to worship. And they had a choice that day. And that choice was they could lick their wounds or they could lift their voices and praise him. They could look around and wonder why it all happened and why it happened to them. Or they could lift their voice and they could praise him. And I kind of I kind of think that's where the church is. I'm not belittling what we've been through. I know people have been wounded. I'd love to pray for some people tonight. I know that there are leaders who are running on empty. I know that there are leaders in here who have depleted reserves. And I would love to pray for any leader and every leader in here tonight who feels in that space. But I think we also have a choice to make. We have a choice to make where we say, look what's happened to us. Look at all we've had to go through. Look what all has came against us. We have a choice. We could lick our wounds and the enemy would love us to lick our wounds. That is the victim spirit. That's what he wants us to do. Or here the church could rise up. And it could begin, as just like Paul and Silas did, they began to lift their song. As the church could rise up with the inspired speech that we've been talking about all night, with the mouths touched with holy fire that we've been talking about all night, with a live coal that's came from off the altar of heaven somewhere, having touched our mouths, that we would rise up and we would begin to lift our song. And we would say, no, we won't be silent. We will sing our songs of praise. We will sing the songs of salvation. We will sing the songs of freedom. We will prophesy of better days and greater days to come that we would rise up with mouths that have been touched by a holy fire and we have the choice to make tonight the choice to make tonight 
to begin to declare his goodness, to stand up and say, yes, look what's happened to us. Let's rise above it. Let's begin to lift our voices. Let's begin to make declarations of all that he has done and all that he will do. I feel that's where we are at prophetically. I know the Lord will heal, voice, heal wounds tonight, but we have the choice to lift our voice. There's something in, and I think there's something in the way that you and I could encounter the Lord tonight that has to do with how we lift our voice and the way that we will lift our voice and how we will use our voice that we will declare in the face of darkness, that we will lift our voice of hope and, 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 and we will lift our voice of worship and intercession and prophetic declaration. Let our voices be heard. You know what happens? Ezekiel 37, says there's loads and loads of bones and there's all of And what does the prophet say? The prophet said, I began to hear a, a noise. I began to hear a sound. There was a sound that began to rise up. There was a sound that began to come. There was a sound that preceded this reviving of this army. It's a sound. I wonder, could there be a sound that could rise up tonight from this place, this building, this auditorium tonight? A sound, a noise, a cry, a hunger that raises up from the body of Christ, from a movement of churches. At a pivotal moment, and it starts with our voices, and it starts with our song. Would you stand with me? Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord God. Bless you, Jesus. So in a few moments, <clears throat> I'm gonna invite you to lift your voice. And maybe that's not something that you're really all that comfortable with, that's okay, you don't have to. But in light of all that was said, it would be really good if you did. I'm gonna encourage you to lift your voice in a few moments. I want you to let the worship flow. It can be in English. It can be in your own language. It can be in tongues. I'm gonna encourage you to let the worship flow. I'm gonna ask you to pray some real simple prayers. Real simple prayers like, Lord, take me deeper. Let me see more tonight. And then what we're gonna do corporately is we're gonna invite the Holy Spirit to come upon us where we are. And I believe that's going to be the moment people are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's going to be people here and you'll speak in tongues for the first time. There'll be people here and you will feel a, an awareness that God is touching your mouth and you'll feel words coming, maybe prophetic words, maybe words of knowledge. You will feel that the Lord's touching your mouth in some way. But we're going to lift our voice and we're going to lift our song tonight. We're going to lift our praise tonight. And we're going to worship him. There are times and there are moments to be in his stillness. That is the, that's the place I'm in most often, the soaking place. There's a time for that and it's beautiful. And there's a time when the church needs to lift its voice and that's tonight. And let the high praise of God be in our mouths. Here, let's take a moment. Let's take a moment. Let's, let's just ask him to make us aware of his presence all around us. Lord, we love you. Lord, we love your presence. We love your presence, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we love you. Lord Jesus, we honor you in this place. We honor you in this place, Lord God. We want more of you, Spirit. More of you, Spirit. More of you, Spirit. We hunger for you. We long for you, Lord God. There's a deep cry in our hearts tonight, Jesus, for more of you, more of you, more of you, more of you, Lord God. We hunger for your presence. We hunger for that fresh touch tonight, Lord. We hunger for an encounter, Lord God. We bless you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Church, come on, let's let it flow tonight. Let the worship flow tonight. We bless you, Jesus. We praise you.
bless you, Lord. In an essay, I'm a randa. Remasiti ere baranda rabakete. Romosso non non dere dere se la marande. Rebossoro boresiti ere baranda. Remera baranda rabakori arabaresse. Tomositi ere barate. Reshari arabaranda rabassondo. Romondo robossi ere baranda rabakete. Resiti ere baranda rabassi ere maranda. We bless you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Remara basiti ere baranda. Ena maranda rabasi ere baranda rabakete. Romoso ndoro basiti ere baranda. Remete ere baranda. Remanda rasi ere baranda rabaranda. Reboso rabaranda. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. More Holy Spirit. 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 We long for you. Hunger for you, Lord. Hunger for you, Jesus. Hunger for you, Lord God. Remese ti ara baranda. Robo soro borondo robo siri ere baranda. Remanda rabasi ara baranda rabakete. Romo sondo robo siti ere baranda. Remanda rabasi ara baranda rabaranda. Rebo sono morianda rabaranda. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. Praise you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Bless you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Bless you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Can I invite you tonight, if you just want that fresh touch of the Spirit, you want to encounter him more, would you just extend your hands to him? Would you lift your hands to him tonight? Just extend your hands to him. Just, just let him know how much you want him, how much you desire him, how much you need him tonight. Jesus, we love you, we need you. We love you, we need you, Lord God. Rebasiana maranda, rabasona moriende. Rebasoro borondo, robosia rabaranda. Rebasari arabaranda. Kerere siene morosona moriende. Bless you, Lord God. Bless you, Jesus. And praise you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Remanda rabasia rabaranda rabasondo. Rebesende, Lord, let the fire come. Let the fire come. The baptism of fire come. The fire fall, Lord. The fire fall. Let the fire come. Touch us with fire tonight. Touch us with holy fire tonight. Touch us with your fire tonight, Jesus. Remesera rabaranda. Touch us with fire tonight, Lord. Bless you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Bless you, Jesus. Remasiti arabaranda rabasi arabarondo. Lord, we bless you. Father, I pray, holy fire in our mouths, Lord. Holy fire in our mouths. Let this movement, this generation, let it speak and prophesy and declare the goodness of God. Let it speak and declare and prophesy the hope at this time. Let it speak and declare and prophesy that greater days are ahead. Let it speak and declare and prophesy a reviving of your, your church, Lord God. We declare it, we declare it, we declare it, we declare it, we declare it. We declare it, we declare it. Bless you, Lord God. Bless you, Lord God. Rebasi arabaranda, rabasonda roborondo. Rebosonda roborondo. Enderere si arabaranda. Rabasi arabaranda. Romondo roboki arabaranda, rabasi arabaranda. Ende arabarasi arabaranda. Rebosondo robosondo. Remanda rabasi arabaranda. Rebasi ti arabaroso roborondo. Bless you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord God. Bless you, Lord. Whatever space you're in with the Lord, you just stay there. Stay in that place of just worshiping Him, crying out to Him, allowing Him to touch you, allowing Him to fill you. There is freedom. You can kneel, you can sit down, you can lie. Whatever you need to do, you just do that tonight. 
Uh, there's a couple of things that I would love to do um, uh, and sense maybe the Lord would be in. And, and that is that I really, really would love to pray for leaders. I could be sort of leaders on their own. It could be leaders. It could be husbands and wives. Wives and husbands could come. I'd really, really love to pray for some people. I really do sense the Lord wants to send you into a new season running. Running on hope. Running with hope. Running with expectancy greater than ever before. So um, I would really love to pray for you. Some of the people in the leadership team would really, really love to pray with you. So we're going to do that in a few moments. And then we're also going to just leave a bit of a space for anybody who would like prayer for any reason just to come to the front. And we have a prayer team that will do that. We'll ask the leadership team to pray with the leaders. And we'll ask the prayer team uh, if they would pray with anybody else who maybe wants to come forward for some prayer. Uh, just before we do that, there's one thing that I'd love us to do. There's a word that's been kind of hanging around since. Uh, there's a flow conference for the EMI churches. That was a, a couple of weeks ago. So great to have the EMI churches here. But there's a word that's been hanging around since then. And it's, it's a word based around uh, Genesis, Genesis um, if I get this right, I think it's Genesis 26. And it's a word around how Isaac went and dug, re-dug the wells of his father. And the scripture actually says, and there's, there's lots to it, but the scripture actually says he, he re-dug the old wells and he dug some new wells. And, and Isaac becomes the person, Abraham's really, really well known, Jacob's really, really well known, but not all that much about Isaac, but Isaac dug the wells. Isaac dug the wells. Here's what I want to ask you to do. This group, us, for the sake of those two or three hundred young people over there, for the kids that are in that room in the back, for the kids that are in the crash, and for every other person who will come through either, either the door or become connected to an Elam church, I want this group to begin to declare that every well be opened. Every well be opened. In every village, town, county, across this island, that the wells be opened, that we be the generation. And here, maybe a bit like Isaac, maybe people might not remember us that much, that'll be okay, won't it? Maybe it'll be the next generation and everybody will remember them. Maybe it'll be the previous generation, everybody, and they might not remember our names, but we'll be the ones who'll dig the well, won't we? We'll be the one who say, Lord, for them, for them, we dig the well, we dig the well, the wells of salvation, the wells of healing, that our children might come into this space where they see healings, week in and week out, where our children come into this space and people respond to the gospel, where our children come into this space carrying the power of God on their lives as they go into their schools, that we will dig the wells tonight. It will be this group that will do it. So I would love us. And the wells are right across. I believe they're already there. They're already there. It's not like you and I are going to find a well. We, we can't locate it really spiritually, but I believe the wells are already in the island of Ireland in all different places. We just need to dig them. We kind of need to locate them, but they exist. They're there. There are wells that we need to dig. And it's your church and it's your place. It's your village. It's your town. It's your county. It's your community. There is a well that is already there. And maybe you and I could just begin to declare that it be opened, that it be opened in this next season. That well be opened, that well be opened. And the people in our communities would experience that living water that can change them and transform them. Come on, let's pray it. Let's pray it. Let's speak it out together. Every well be open, every well be open, every well, every old well be dug, every well that was dug by uh, those who went before, every well that was placed there by those who went before, every well that was placed there, every well that's been placed there over these last hundred years, every well that's been there, every well that's been, we redig it tonight, we redig it tonight. Lord, show us where they are geographically, help us to understand, but Lord, we believe they're in our churches, they're in our place, they're in our communities. So we declare in this next season, every well be open. Opened. Every well be opened. Every well be opened. Old wells be opened up again. We dig new wells tonight. New wells of salvation. New wells of healing. New wells of joy. New wells of transformation. We dig new wells tonight for this next generation to walk into, full of the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, let salvation rise up. Let it rise up. Let it rise up. Let it spring up from the ground. Let salvation rise up. Rise up. Lord, let your church come alive. Let your church church come alive. Let your church come alive, Lord, to all that you want to do, to all that you want to do. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we honor you. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
praise you, Lord. Suzanne and the team are going to lead us. I'm going to invite you. If you're here tonight and you're a leader and you would love some prayer, you just need your expectancy to be raised and uh, you just need that hope to run into this next season. I'm going to kind of invite you if you can come over to, to this section over here that there'll be some people from the leadership team who will come and will pray over you. So if you're a leader and you want prayer, then please uh, allow us the privilege of ministering to you. And then if you're here tonight and maybe you, maybe as we were worshiping together, maybe you didn't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you're expecting for it, or maybe there's just something on your heart and something that you really, really need prayer for, I'm going to invite you to come down to this space around here and there'll be people from our brilliant prayer ministry team who will be there and they will pray with you and will take as much time as we need to to pray with you. If you don't want to come to the front, that's fine. Here, just worship along. Enjoy the Lord's presence and worship him tonight. Let me just pray. Father God, Lord, we pray that your spirit would increase and continue. And I pray even at the front here, Lord, that you would encounter people. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you.